Curse of the Pharaoh. The trumpets of the Pharaoh, Tutankhamun, Lord of the Crown, King of the South and North, Son of Bray. The sight that was eventually to unfold before his eyes was to prove stupefying in its golden magnificence. After years of patient, hopeful but often disheartening exploration of the desolate Valley of the Kings at Thebes, now the modern city of Luxor, 420 miles south of Cairo, Carter had been rewarded with a find of such archaeological significance and funereal opulence that the world was staggered by the news. It was on November 26, 1922, that Howard Carter, with his wealthy English sponsor, Lord Carnarvon, by his side, faced the door that led to the four-room tomb built for Tutankhamun, the pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, who died about 1350 BC, when he was only about 18 years of age, after a reign of six years. What was to be revealed behind the doors of the tomb was to reward them beyond their wildest dreams, but stranger things were to follow, for in the decades to come, all who first gazed at the fabulous tomb or were associated with its discovery, were struck down in one way or another. These personal disasters, involving even death by suicide, raised the question, had they been victims of a curse? The idea was ridiculed, but there were many, including Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the man who created Sherlock Holmes, who believed that the broaching of Tutankhamun's tomb after more than 3,000 years of almost entirely undisturbed peace had invoked some bane on those who invaded its sanctity. The uneasy feeling still persists. The systematic search for relics of Egypt's fabulous past, cities, monuments, tombs and documents, had been progressing long before the uncovering of King Tutankhamun's last resting place. The quest gathered impetus in the 1880s and 1890s with the formation of the British Egypt Expedition, led by Sir W. M. Flinders Petrie. Among the finds that came to light over the years were more than 40 mummies of Egyptian pharaohs buried in the Valley of the Kings. But even before these discoveries, the ornate, well-planned tombs of the long-dead kings had not been left in peace. Down the centuries, their last resting places had been violated by grave robbers, and the gold, ornaments, furniture, jewellery, buried to serve the pharaohs in their next life, had been plundered and scattered. These ghoulish enterprises had so disheartened later archaeological teams that when the First World War broke out in 1914, most of the scientific exploratory parties had given up hope of finding anything of significance. Not so the Fifth Earl of Carnarvon, a wealthy dilettante with an amateur's absorption on archaeology, and his scientist partner Howard Carter, who was then Inspector General of the Egyptian Government Antiquities Department. Carnarvon, a man of indifferent health, had gone to Egypt in 1903 to avoid the punishing English winter. There, in the land of the pharaohs, his interest in archaeology had been stimulated by what had been going on. There, in the land of the pharaohs, his interest in archaeology had been stimulated by what had been going on. But as he was no expert in such matters, he sought out a man who was. That man was Howard Carter. Between 1907 and 1914, they discovered and explored a number of tombs with hardly stimulating results. But during the same period, an American archaeologist, Theodore Davis, had unearthed a number of artefacts in the Valley of the Kings, which suggested that they had an association with the tomb of Tutankhamun. The finds, however, were disappointing, and in 1914, Davis relinquished his concession to explore the valley. This was to prove the break that Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter had prayed for. Unlike Davis, they were convinced that Tutankhamun's tomb did exist and could be found. They sought and were granted permission to carry out the search. World War I put a halt to their exploratory work, and it was not until 1917 that Carter and his team were at work again in the valley by the Nile. For five years they worked, driven on by the conviction that somewhere the elusive tomb was hidden among the mass debris left by earlier searchers. Time was running out, but a few days before Carter's permit to dig was due to expire, his workmen unearthed a step cut into rock. Soon another step was revealed. Thirty-six hours later, twelve steps that led to a sealed doorway had been uncovered. 
Carter, seething with excitement and anticipation, still did not know whose tomb lay behind the door, but he knew he was on the verge of a tremendous discovery. There was nothing on the seals on the uncovered part of the door to indicate that it was the tomb of any particular pharaoh, let alone Tutankhamun. Before he made another move, before he made another move, Carter telegraphed Lord Carnarvon, then in England, to be on hand when the doors of the tomb were opened. On November 24, 1922, Carnarvon watched Carter descend the stairs, now numbering 16, and revealing the full depth of the door on which the seals of Tutankhamun were to be seen. But to Carter's horror, he saw that the seals were not the originals. The doors had been resealed not once, but twice. It took another two days before the door was breached and a passageway forced through the massive obstructions behind it. Some 30 feet beyond the first door was a second door, which had also been resealed at some time. Carefully, Howard Carter made a small hole in the door and gazed through. He could see little, but enough to make his heart pound. He made the hole large enough to shine a torch through and gasped. Here was a room littered with fantastic treasures. Two life-size figures carved in black and facing each other like guardians on either side of still another door. Three huge gilt couches, inlaid caskets, alabaster vases, golden chariots and rare artefacts all tumbled in a ray. Carter, almost unable to speak because of emotion, told a tense Carnarvon what he had seen. Recording his first impression later, Carter wrote, As my eyes grew accustomed to the light, Details of the room emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold. Everywhere the glint of gold. Before the third door guarded by the black figures could be reached, the cluttered anteroom had to be cleared. This work took fifty days, as each precious relic was photographed and removed to a nearby makeshift laboratory to be restored and catalogued. Carter must have been sorely tempted to force the third door right there and then, but he decided against it until he was fully prepared. He closed the tomb and made for Cairo, where he organised packing cases, preservatives, wadding and photographic equipment. He even procured a steel gate to guard the antechamber door. In the meantime, the news of the find had so electrified the world that hordes of newspapermen and tourists thronged to the Valley of the Kings. They multiplied the difficulties of Carter's task. There was, in fact, an occasion when so many onlookers straddled the wall around the upper level of the tomb that Carter was deeply concerned in case the wall crumbled under their weight. It was not until February 17, 1923, that work could begin on the next stage, the opening of the third sealed door of the cleared anteroom. There was no doubt now that it would lead to the mummy of the king, but once more he was dismayed to find that the tiny door had already been resealed, suggesting that again someone had been there before him, However, he need not have worried. When the tiny doorway, which had been protected by a golden couch, was cleared, Carter beheld the side of an ornate golden shrine. Stepping down into the sepulchre chamber, he and Lord Carnarvon were conscious of a strange sense of intrusion as they broke the silence and dispelled the darkness which had reigned in the tomb for more than three thousand years. In the dim light they saw a golden shrine, very high, with inlaid panels of exquisite blue on which were inscribed hieroglyphics. At the far end of this shrine room, with its golden walls, were two folding doors, which they unbolted only to be confronted by two more bolted doors. This time the seals were unbroken. Carter broke the seals and entered. Now he was in the inner sepulchre, the first man to stand there for more than three thousand years. The date was February 3rd, 1924. Almost a year had gone by. So much time had been absorbed in removing and packing the treasures of the third room. Here at last was the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun, of yellow quartzite, nearly nine feet long and five feet high. It contained coffins, the innermost, which was another coffin of solid gold and weighing 2,448 pound. Today it would be worth in material terms more than $20 million. The gold coffin contained the king's mummy, which was covered by another priceless find, a superb gold death mask finely wrought with lapis lazuli and other precious stones in the likeness of the dead boy Pharaoh. The mask was described by Howard Carter as bearing the sad but calm expression of a youth prematurely overtaken by death. Newspapers now held the find as a new cave of Aladdin, its wealth beyond the dreams of avarice. Howard Carter's patient, painstaking labours had been rewarded beyond his own dreams, but Lord Carnarvon, the man whose interest and backing had made the excavations possible, 
was not there to relish the supreme moment of discovery his sponsorship had earned him, setting eyes on the king's mummy. Carnarvon and his daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert, had gone for a change to Aswan and returned to Luxor on March the 6th. Two days later, while in the Valley of the Kings, he was bitten by a mosquito on the right cheek. He took little notice of the bite, but when shaving one morning, he nicked the scab. Within days, the wound had become septic. It was treated at Luxor with seemingly good effect. However, in Cairo, where he had gone on March 14th, complications involving blood poisoning set in. His lungs became affected and his condition steadily worsened. On April 5th, he died. It seemed a simple case of an infection taking hold and causing a fatal condition. But there were several uncanny events connected with Lord Carnarvon's death and these led to uneasy speculation. At the time he died, the lights of Cairo inexplicably went out. Five minutes later, they came on again. Puzzled engineers could offer no explanation for the curious incident and, as if there was some invisible thread spanning more than 2,000 miles from Egypt to England, a strange incident occurred that night on Lord Carnarvon's peaceful, park-like estate in Hampshire. His favourite dog stirred at the very hour of his master's death, howled mournfully, then fell dead. When the news of these mystifying events spread, people began to believe that Lord Carnarvon had fallen victim to an ancient curse of the pharaohs. The story went around, too, that on the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb was inscribed, Death shall come on swiftest wings to him who touches the tomb of the pharaoh. As events unfolded, the apocryphal curse gave even the sceptics cause to wonder. For not long after Lord Carnarvon's death, two archaeologists closely associated with work on Tutankhamun's tomb were also dead. The disturbing feeling that perhaps a curse was exercising an evil influence was given another emphasis when two famous writers, Marie Corelli and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, threw in their weight on the side of the curse. In fact, two weeks before Lord Carnarvon's death, Miss Corelli, a best-selling romantic novelist, wrote to a newspaper warning that punishment would be meted out to those foolhardy enough to tamper with a pharaoh's tomb. From a rare book which she said she possessed, Miss Corelli quoted, Miss Corelli quoted, there were several diverse poisons enclosed in boxes in such ways that they who touch them shall not know how they came to suffer. For his part, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a student of the occult and creator of literature's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, expounded the view that Lord Carnarvon's death could have been caused by elementals, not souls, not spirits, created by Tutankhamun's priests to guard the tomb. A month after Lord Carnarvon's death, an American railroad magnate, Jay Gould, died of pneumonia after catching a cold while visiting Tutankhamun's tomb. In the following July, Prince Ali Kemal Fahmy Bey, a visitor to the tomb, met a violent death. He was shot by his wife in their suite at the Savoy Hotel in London. Howard Carter, who could have been expected to bear the brunt of any curse, scoffed at the talk of a curse. Sane people, he said, should dismiss such inventions with contempt. Yet he too was given some cause for disquiet. The day the tomb was opened, his pet canary, which had been left at his residence singing happily in its cage, was swallowed by a cobra, significantly a sacred royal Egyptian symbol. Many other experts shared Carter's disdain for the curse, but at least one renowned translator of Egyptian manuscripts, Dr. J.C. Madras, was certain the Egyptians of old knew how to imbue their mummies with a dynamism by means of a magic ritual. This, he said, could have a harmful effect on those who violated the tomb. While the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb was worldwide news, the significance of the finds were in danger of taking place to the so-called curse. And even though the authorities at the British Museum called the talk foolish and deplorable, the rumours continued to circulate. For one family, in particular the curse, if curse it was, became a nightmare. Captain Richard Bethel, who was Carter's secretary, died suddenly in November 1929, and tragedy continued to stalk his family. The following February, his father, Lord Westbury, who possessed some relics from the tomb, committed suicide by flinging himself 70 feet from a window to the ground. At his funeral, the hearse bearing Lord Westbury's body to the cemetery accidentally killed an eight-year-old child. Strangely, Tutankhamun himself was not much older when he was enthroned as pharaoh. And the extraordinary chain of tragedies did not stop there. In 1956, Captain Bethel's widow took her life. The stories of a curse and their perpetuation may have a simple commercial explanation. Some believe the curse was invented by newspaper men who were unhappy at the arrangement Howard Carter made for releasing news of his discovery. 
At the time of the find, Carter and Lord Carnarvon, pestered by spectators asking countless questions, were concerned that valuable time would be lost. Worse, they feared the exquisite treasure itself might be damaged. Where the newsmen were concerned, Carter decided to save himself answering innumerable questions by giving the Times correspondent, Arthur Merton, world rights to the story on the understanding that Merton would pass on the facts of the discovery to other press men. This arrangement was angrily resented by other correspondents, some of them recognised authorities on archaeology. The upshot was that Merton's story detailing the discovery and published in the Times on November 30th, 1922, was one of the greatest scoops in newspaper history. By way of retaliation against Carter's manner of disclosing his finds, some disappointed correspondents are then said to have concocted the curse story. Whether this is true or otherwise, no curse pursued Carter. He died in 1939, aged 65. Today, the king who started it all, Tutankhamun, continues to be the subject of newspaper stories.